The priority of the fire service and when we respond to calls is to identify and look for opportunities to save a life. We want to introduce this series to you today that's titled Life Priority. This project was thought of and brought to the attention of the training division from engineer Tyler Williamson. Well, really the fire service as a whole is to thank for this series and we have a strong foundation of passing on the tools of the trade for this job. This project is about looking at grabs we've had in the district, opportunities to make a difference and save a life. If you're not willing to sit down with me on camera and talk, I understand, but talk to the firefighter next to you, talk to your crew and pass on those lessons learned. Talk to me and let me know so that I can be better at my job. In the fire service, there's plenty of calls that happen that we learn about, that we know about, whether we were there or not. But our number one priority is life. And this series is about that. It's an opportunity for us to hyper-focus on those in our district who have been in the right place at the right time and been prepared and some of the lessons they learned so all of us can get better as a district. So when we are faced with that opportunity to save a life, we're ready, we're prepared. And we have some slides from our brothers and sisters around us who have done it before. This is coming out, this is coming out. The fire ground is dynamic. Priorities can change by the second. This series is about our first priority, life priorities. We'll hear from the firefighters that have made a grab in live fire conditions, the decisions they made and the lessons they learned. Listen as they tell you about their experience, learn from their mistakes and their successes. Expect fire and expect victims. Expect the unexpected and plan accordingly. This is life priority. Thanks again for your time, and why don't you go ahead and run us through this next uh, situation you found yourself in. Sure, yeah. So uh, <laughs> we were on uh, Truck 50. Uh, we got dispatched to a uh, residential structure fire. On our way there, we'd heard that there's a possible disabled victim in the house. Um, so we prepared for rescue. Uh, we showed up, um, Truck 50, and we did a uh, basically a Team 3 split. So the, uh, the fireman, Derek Sheets, and I in the back, jumped off and went all in for a uh, for primary. And as we're pulling up, it was kind of weird because it's uh, we're looking at a modular home. We had decent smoke production. We're looking at a modular, modular home and I hear a bell going off and I'm like, it sounds like a sprinklers are going off or something, but we're looking at this modular home and it was kind of confusing. The lady basically tells us that her husband's inside um, and she pointed to the room where he was. Had pretty good smoke production, but not, I uh, didn't see any fire. Um, but good smoke production, pushing out of pretty much every side of this, of this building. So it looked like conversion was being made, and we're like, what's going on? We realized the house was partially sprinkled, this modular home and flooring was sprinklered. They opened the door, this big pit bull kind of dog run comes out, it kind of freaks me out for a second. Smoke level was about knee, uh, knee height, a couple dogs came ran, running out, okay. um, but uh, no flame, no fire or anything like that. Um, right as we went in, Derek said, hey, I'm going to go find the hallway. And so he immediately beat feet Jeez, back into this building again. Pretty, uh, pretty smoked out, but you could kind of, I could make out a flashlight about five feet away. Um, I conducted a primary in the beginning in the entryway to see if he was on the couch Jeez, or in, in something in the beginning there. I immediately head back to where I uh, can tell the bathroom is. Um, and, or I mean, not the bathroom, the bedroom. Uh, we walk back there and I'm yelling for his name. Jeez. I'm yelling, sir, sir, can you hear me? And I can kind of hear some mufflings, but Schmidt, God bless him, um, he's behind me and he keeps, he thinks I'm calling for him. So he's like, I'm like, sir. And Schmidt's like, Sheets, where are you? I'm like, sir, where you at? And Schmidt keeps going, Sheets. And I'm like, like, Schmidt, like, uh, I'm fine, bud. But he and I echoed each other and I could hear he was calling for me to come down the hallway to him. Um, right as I started to make my way down the hallway, he goes, hey, I found him. And so we, uh, I followed his voice down the hallway, and at this point, the smoke was all the way down to the floor. Uh, actually, I opened the door, and I actually ended up, I actually ended up kind of kicking the guy with my boot. And he's like, "Ow!" And I'm like, "Oh, there you are." Uh, so I opened the door. Um, we got water. There's a lot of water in in the house at this point because the sprinklers. Um, uh, so he's just laying down there. He's disabled. He can't walk. And so I made it through two other rooms and was kind of assessing the situation, see if I could hear anything else. Came back to Derek and uh, he and I started formulating our plan. Um, uh, Derek was trying to assist this gentleman back onto his back because he was 
Uh, it was a sprinkler uh, double wide, which was exactly very weird. Um, but we had a ton of water spraying in the room. He was really, yeah, no flame, there. I guess. There you go. Yeah, yeah well, it, it kept the fire in check. Mm -hmm. um, but this guy I, was basically drowning in, in water. So Derek was able to uh, flip the guy over mm -hmm. into his back. I tell Schmitty, hey, I got him. And I asked Schmitty to try and find another way out. And uh, then I made contact with him and, and told Derek, I said, hey, so let's see if we, I go, sir, can you stand up and walk? Because I mean, it'd be all right. He said, this guy can get up and we just walk him out. Yeah, he, uh, yeah he, was, he was laying there and he was able to communicate with us with short breaths um, just because the smoke level was pretty low. Um, and uh, I immediately grabbed onto his arms and just kind of sat him up and moved him out of the doorway so we had a little bit more room to work. Um, yelled down the hallway to uh, Captain Beard and to Captain Barthel that we located the victim and we needed people to start clearing a path for us. So that was one of the sides I picked up from the first one was, I know we need a way out of here. Um, I gave them to Derek and then I immediately started searching other rooms to see if there was a second way out. Um, I, both rooms I went into were just total hoarder house and there was no way we were gonna go through there. So I told Derek, I said, hey, let's just go back out the way we came in. Um. This is kind of a learning lesson we can talk about, but um, we couldn't find another way out that was easy. Um, so we're going back the way we came. Well, now that hose line's in there, right? They got hose line, they're putting the fire out um, in uh, the kitchen, uh, I believe is where it was, is where the majority of it was. Um, so we had to go back over the hose line to get this guy out. So we ended up um, you know, picking him up from his limbs, me, Schmidt, got him out of the room down the hallway and by that time our the rest of our truck crew was helping us so we kind of lifted him up over the hose line we got people coming in luckily it wasn't too hot so it wasn't that big of a deal the guy was fairly heavy it was kind of a bigger gentleman probably about 240 250 and then like i said just flaccid you know so picked him up and derek and i just started taking off derek reminded me hey don't kick him in the head so i had the guy's head between my legs so you guys slowed down how to plan yeah yeah you know, we were making the plan as we were moving sure. so we weren't going to talk about it very much longer other than <laughs> we know we needed to get him out um, good key points on it is grabbing joints versus grabbing skin. Uh, I didn't know how badly burned he was. He did have some uh, burn marks on him, okay. um, but having grabbed just his forearms, one, it's very difficult to just squeeze some of his forearms for a very long time to pick him up and carry him out. Uh, you really do want to grab by joints because it gives you something to hold on to. Uh, so Derek had him by the knees, I had him by the elbows, and his head was between my legs as we were walking. So okay. basically picked him up um, face up. And so we were able to make it all the way to the entry, uh, to the entry, and then we kind of regroup. We had to get regrip. Uh, hose line then passed us to go take fire attack, and then we were able to uh, get outside. Uh, Captain Beard and Captain Barthel both had the gurney up, right up next to the uh, door. Medic 62 had showed up. Uh, their gurney was, or maybe it was Medic 50, was at the ramp for us. So once we got outside, that's when uh, Engineer Haggerty was there, and I think one of the other engineers off the off the engine was there. And between the six of us, we were able to transfer that, uh, that victim from the entryway onto, uh, onto the gurney. You know, we went in there uh, knowing potentially where the victim was. You know, we had, I mean, it was pretty easy for us to, we, dispatch tells us as we're rolling up that we've got a known victim. It's confirmed when we get there um, by the wife. Um, she points to the general area that he's in. Um, and you know, and as we're entering, the hose line was um, also coming in too. So, you know, we had that protection behind us too, if we needed that as well. Um, and like I said, we looked for another way out. We had Schmidt look for another way out. He opened all the doors. He's like, we're not gonna get out any other way easier than the way that we just came. Um, there was just too much furniture and, uh, you know, whatever else they had in there. Uh, so coming out, going over the hose line, uh, it's obviously pretty tough because you got to lift that victim up over the hose line. It's nice to have all four of us. That was extremely helpful. Obviously, that victim can't help us in any way. He's disabled. Um, and, you know, I think in retrospect, I might have, you know, gab grabbed a carry-all or something like that or um, grabbed a sheet uh, from his bedroom. But he, there was a lot of fire in that bedroom, too, because it started when he was, when it, as he was smoking as well, I believe. Um, so that was kind of the lesson of, of, of yarding them out, you know, with with some sort of a carrying device, whether it's sheets or blankets or a carry-all or however that looks. Like Derek sheets, yeah, like Derek sheets. <laughs> sheets taking them out with sheets. Are you talking about yourself? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was kind of the, the lesson learned, but, um, you know, it all kind of happened so fast to remember to grab a carry-all sometimes is not the easiest thing. And 
you know, I mean, we practice this stuff all the time, right? It's kind of what we're here to do. It's the most important thing that we do, right? It's, you know, life safety. Um, but when it all starts to come together and you realize that you're actually going to be pulling somebody out, you know, sometimes a few things slip through the cracks. But overall, I think we were safe. Uh, we had all the help we needed. The communication was great with, uh, with the IC. We had a medic there waiting. The medic was, we didn't have to go find the ambulance, you know. We, those guys and gals were there kind of to throw them on the gurney and, and then they, uh, they took off and he had a full recovery. Lessons learned uh, is uh, earlier notification. Uh, I think uh, working with Derek before on the truck, we both have very similar uh, ideas about how we were gonna remove the victim. Uh, we briefly discussed taking him out the window, but Ixnade that just because we would have to break out the window, break out the sash. The guy was completely nude. Um, so taking him out the window would have possibly chopped him up. Plus there was a large tree, there was a bunch of debris on the side. It, would been, it made access very difficult to try and get this guy out. Um, but you really do, we knew the way we came in, we knew about how far it was. And uh, Derek and I both uh, agreed basically that we were gonna be, uh, gonna be able to execute this guy straight out the way we came in. Uh, looking back on it, having done once we went back through the house, there was a third door that I didn't, I couldn't see, um, and that would have taken us straight. It's a double one, right? So you yeah. Like a slider coming in, and then usually something in the laundry. Yeah, room. this was a basically their side door that was between the bathroom and that bedroom. Right. My cylinder was on it, and I was just feeling doorknob on either side. I didn't realize there was another one right behind me, right. Um, and that would have taken us right out to the Charlie side, and we could have gone back to, through the weeds and everything to the driveway, and then gone out that way too. Right. Um, yeah, I mean so, hindsight. Well, you know, whatever. It, it would have been helpful to go that way. It would have prolonged us getting them onto the so gurney. didn't have a pre-plan of his double one, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah it, was, it wasn't on the map book. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the rescue itself uh, was very quick. Locating the victim, uh, we found out it was about four, a little over four minutes from air, air medic engine 50 being on scene to the victim being in the back of the ambulance and on their way to the hospital. So uh, I feel like four minutes pretty quick. That was, that was a good one. Um, not a lot of heat, again. Um, victim being on the floor, uh, almost drowned, but was on the floor at least, was below the smoke. Um, was still difficult to see because of how much smoke was in the building, um, but we weren't battling this high heat, you know, push you to the floor thing. Uh, we didn't have to take refuge in a, build, in a room or anything like that. It's a time to think. Yeah, I mean, it was relatively quick. I think the conversation uh, between Sheets and I was roughly about 10 seconds as to what we were going to do. Um, can you walk? No? Okay, let's sit him up. I'll look for another way out. Open two doors. Nope, we got to go back out the way he came in. There was no argument. There was no discussion other than, let's go. And so I just asked Derek if he was ready. He said, yeah, and then up we went. And he said, just watch his head. And then we took off, had to regroup one time, and then we were out. Having those two... Uh, captains ahead of us basically moving people and moving furniture and voicing us how much further we had to go uh, was very helpful. Um, keep, they also did a very good job uh, having discipline of not trying to help us as far as getting hands on because we were in that narrow hallway. More people would have made this much more difficult. Um, it would have, they would have been in the way. So um, Derek was plenty strong. We were able to pick this gentleman up, get him right on out. Um, and get them outside. Uh, right after the call, we did discuss some things where having a carry-all at that front door, not bringing it in, not actually searching with the carry-all, but bringing it up with you and staging it at the front door. So if you do locate a victim, is being able to communicate that, and that would be part of your needs for your CAN report, I need the carry-all. Because if we were able to totally cocoon this guy in that thing and use that to pick up, when we turned to get out, we could have used one of those other people once we got into the entryway to actually pick him up and get him out. Uh, does a couple things for you. One, completely burritos your victim and keeps all their limbs in. That was a huge thing with this guy. His arm, because he was, had a stroke, his one arm just wanted to keep kind of falling out of my hand. So by grabbing his elbows, his one, he was able to hold on to my bicep as we were going out, but the other one just kept getting hit into doors and, and jams and stuff like that on the way out. And it was kind of getting in my way because it was just so floppy. Um, same thing with the legs. The legs were real heavy. He was a big person, soaking wet, so it was kind of hard to grab onto him. Having that carry-all that has a nice texture to it and the loops, being able to hold on to that, we would have been able to pick that straight up and been able to carry him out. And if we had to drag him on the floor, now his skin is protected from any hot embers on the floor, carpet, glass, I mean, anything else, you know, just his normal debris that was in his house uh, would have been very helpful. Also, if we were not able to extricate him that way, we now have a carry-all to keep him in compass, to pick him up and go out a window as well to keep him from getting chopped up. Um, I think Carol is a, is a very underutilized piece of equipment for extricating victims. Um, it's not going to work with everybody. The one with Stoops, we obviously didn't need it, 
But for this gentleman being as big and as wet and as naked as he was, being able to wrap him up in that thing and keep him protected to get him out would absolutely have been fantastic. Um, the radio communication went very well. Uh, B9 was aware that we'd located the victim very quick and that we were extricating him. So you and or Derek were able to get that out? Once we that just told happened. the captain. That okay. was it. You I just said, yelled hey, we it just to him down the hallway and he handled. That was it. All I yep. said is, hey, we need a medic at the door. Told that me. was all I told him. Um, and the, the captains handled all the radio traffic. And like I said, our, extra, our extrication plan, getting them out, they cleared all the furniture for us and basically were our voice telling us how much further we had to go, which is also a nice thing to hear because you're pretty tired carrying this guy like, oh, I don't, you know, how much further we have to go? 10 feet, 15 feet, you know, whatever it was, and we were out. Um, and then once we got outside, that receiving team was also out there who weren't all packed up yet. They were able to, very able to move their arms around and stuff and were able to help us grab the victim and immediately put him on, on the gurney. The medic had backed down in the driveway, we were super slick to just get him in the back of the gurney and then they were gone. Smooth operation. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that one went well. I, I really think with the carry all though had we had that stage at the door. One of the captains maybe would have been able to grab that and bring it in as we were dragging him out into the hallway. Could have slid underneath him. We put him right in that carryall, and then we all picked a, a loop, and we were going to be able to get out, get out of there. Because once we got in the entryway, there was tons of room for us to walk, and uh, Derek and I were still the only two that were really grabbing him and, and kept going. So um, you mentioned the carryall. I've seen that uh, a bed sheet used for that same yeah. tactic. I know we've talked about that as yep. well. So yeah. Bed Sounds like this operation was pretty smooth. You guys were heads up. Yeah, this one First in good. truck, team three split, had a, got an update, had a plan, mm -hmm. voiced that plan, crews assisted. Yeah, this one we really did. I was anticipating finding them. Um, that was the other mindset. Expect fire, expect victims, right? Yeah, that was definitely my mindset had changed from the first one to this one. Um, I was definitely anticipating finding this guy. It's just where were we going to find him? And that's why I didn't want to leave anything unturned right at the beginning. I didn't want to go deep into this building and then find them by the front door or in like over on the couch or something like that. So you talked about your plan, you talked about some tools, talked about it kind of being well, a double wide and, and a hoarder house. Yeah. Um, is there any other big lessons learned or is there anything you would have changed on yeah, this Yeah, I think the carry all would have helped. Um, and uh, obviously maybe searching a little bit more thoroughly for that potential second way out. Okay. Um, I feel like I, I gave up on it relatively quickly, even though I'd searched two rooms that were just off of his room. So you knew one way would work. Yeah, not so, a big yeah. house, and I didn't want to have this conversation right then. Yeah. It was pretty much, hey, I've searched these other two. There's no other way there. The one's a bathroom, one's the other bedroom that's full of junk. Let's just, I know the way we came in. I know that we can get out that way. It's not that far. We're in a double wide. So going back out the same way we came in was familiar to us. And I knew that going back out, especially with the, uh, the two captains clearing the material out of our way, we had the best chance to, to get out uh, a little bit quicker than when we had first made entry into the building. Great. Yeah. Anything you want to add? Just expect to, uh, to find people and uh, anticipate um, uh, your exit. Like always, if you can, you have the wherewithal to be, as you're searching, kind of counting the doors on the way down to realize how many rooms in you are. And then check those and see if there is a, a second exit to get out. Um, and if you have good enough visibility and you can see there's a second way out, just keep that in the back of your mind. So if you do find somebody, maybe going all the way back out isn't your best plan. Going to the secondary uh, entrance or egress is probably going to be your, your next best bet. Yeah, all the work's put into finding the victim, right? But right. the job's only half done then, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Don't be afraid to pass somebody off, too. If you feel like you are getting to that point where you're too exhausted to, to carry out the rest of the operation or you're slowing it down and hindering it, Pass them off to somebody. Let somebody know early. That's part of your can report, right? Your needs. Um, I'm, I'm going to be able to pull this guy, you know, 20, 30 feet, but I'm going to need somebody to pick up my slack and get them a little bit further, you know. Um, or go down to the legs. The legs being, you know, kind of heavy too. Go down there, help your partner out. Grab a leg, give them a break too. Have somebody else take the arms and the head and, and uh, get that person out. You know, the most important thing that we do is, you know, life safety, right? And so when you're getting all those confirmations, um, that there's actually somebody in there. Um, obviously, we're going to risk a lot to, to go in there and, and save them. Um, but what I, I feel like what we don't want to do is get away from if we don't have those confirmations, right? Uh, if we don't have dispatch telling us, right? These are the big things that we, that I think that we, we hear, oh, all out, right? Everybody's out. Okay, well, is everybody out? Like, we still got to go in there like we're looking for somebody. So, um, this risk tolerance was pretty low because it was cold smoke for the most part. Uh, we had a hose line in there. We knew right where the, pay, the victim was. We had, like you said, double confirmation. So obviously, you know, it's, it's a little easier to, 
to take that, if you want to call it a risk, a risk. Um, but what I, obviously some of the other grabs that people have gotten, like the 21 folks, when they save that kid, you know, um, you know, they risked a lot more, obviously it was a lot hotter. Um, I even believe that they weren't sure that the, the, the kid was gonna survive and they ended up bumping into him and, and found him kinda on that hasty search right off the hose line and I believe it happened. Um, so I guess what I can say is we have to do these searches, whether we get confirmation or not, like there's somebody in there, you know, and we have to search in a way that confirms that rather than just hearing all out or like, oh, nobody's in here, you know what I mean? They said it's all out, so we'll just kind of do a quick little primary search, you know what I mean? So uh, we've all been on fires where we miss a pet maybe or something like that, and we, uh, you know, that could be, you know, that could be a person or something like that. So we got to go, or, you know, some people, you know, you ask Captain Mitchell, you know, his, uh, his dog is one of his favorite people in the world. So, you know, we got to go in there assuming we're going to find somebody um, before we uh, just kind of brush this, the, in, the primary search off, for lack of a better word. Thank you for your willingness to, to speak about this incident. And not everybody has the opportunity to share a kitchen table with you and, and gain this insight. So hopefully this will, you know, spread some information out there. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this whole, you know, this profession or career or calling, I guess, would be a more appropriate way to say it, right? Uh, we're only going to get better at it if we, if we share our stories and, and uh, you know, kind of the things that worked and the things that didn't work. I don't consider this as a, as a, as a dig me thing. I think this is a, it's an honor. It's, uh, we're extremely fortunate to be able to do this job, like I said earlier, and to be able to talk about it and have other people learn, like I said, that maybe never will get a grab or the, you know, or maybe some people like Schmidt's got three, right? You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's like I said earlier, it's the thing that we, it's the number one thing that we're here to do and it's to help the public. That's what we're here for. We're not here to, for any sort of dig me lifestyle, right? And uh, I think that hopefully by me doing this as one of the least dig me people there are, hopefully, um, maybe some of those people will, will share their story and, and, and kind of allow those newer firefighters, like we have all these recruits out here, we're trying to teach them with our experience and that's all you'd be doing by sitting down and having a conversation with you, so. Firefighter Sheets, you've been in your seat a lot longer than most and have gained, no doubt, a ton of experience along the way. If there's one or a few little nuggets you'd like to throw, um, newer firefighters like myself or you know, somebody that might be riding your seat or trying to get in that seat. I don't know. I guess I could say just come to work prepared to do your job. Be humble. Uh, realize that, you know, we're here to do one thing, that's to help the public. Let's not forget that. Um, I know this isn't truck based or search based or anything like that. I think that uh, we all need to come here and, and, and realize that we're extremely fortunate to be able to do this job. There's not a day that I don't sit in that truck seat and just think, wow, I hit the lottery. And I think that uh, I think a lot of people feel that way and we need to continue to take this job seriously because, you know, we're not all going to get rescues in our career. Some will go through this entire their entire career without getting one, but we're doing a lot of other great things outside of that. So just because I'm sitting in a truck seat doesn't mean that I'm any more different or special than anybody else, right? And most of our saves are on the ambulances and and doing the little things, you know. Um, you know, just remember why we got into this. It's to it's for public service, and let's let's just be humble and grateful that we have this fantastic uh, career. Fire service is about tradition. One of our traditions is about passing on our experiences and our lessons learned. When we do this, the story doesn't focus on the individual, but the team and the outcome. These lessons are shared so that you can better serve the public and your fellow firefighters. If you have a rescue and you're hesitant to tell your story, remember, the lessons you share may help save someone else's life or your own. Share your story by contacting us at Life priority at metrofire.ca.gov.